let us bow for a word of prayer. God, it's because, it's simply because you are God. Come into this moment now as we seek to hear from your word. Praying and expecting and anticipating you to speak to us in a powerful way because you are God. God, we come with hearts that are celebrating uh, even in the midst of this season of chaos and confusion because you are God. God, we come into this moment to remember and to think back on all that you have done for us. How you've redeemed us and you've set us free. And we know that can only happen because you are God. So now as we seek to hear from you, Lord, we pray that your spirit moves to the homes and the hearts of your people right now. Whoever they gathered watching this, whoever's tuned in to these moments of worship, we pray, God, that you would make their hearts and their spirits receptive to the word. God, we pray in these moments that you would punish not your people for the frailty of your preacher, but that you would use me in spite of me. So people would be edified and that you, God, would get all of the glory. It is in the matchless name of our risen and revolutionary redeemer, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And all God's children said, amen, amen, and amen, amen. Again, we honor God and praise God for our music ministry today for Reverend Marcus Coleman and the way that he has shared so powerfully uh, in song and for our media team and for, um, for all who work so hard that we might be able to meet in this virtual space each and every week. Uh, today we want to launch from the book of Acts, the book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26 in the New International Version. Um, you can find it, you can tag it in your Bible or on your, your tablet or mobile device. Um, but it will also be on the screen for you to read along with us. Just two verses uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 26. Uh, Acts 26, verses 28 and 29. Uh, from the New International Version reads this way. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. This is the word of the Lord for today, for the people of God, and we pray that God will continue uh, to honor the word of God. For the time that we have together, I'd like to tag this text this morning uh, with the topic I've got a story to tell. I've got a story to tell. Stories are perhaps the most powerful form of communicating truths that transcend context or situation. And perhaps this is best illustrated by the age-old stories known as Aesop's fables. These are short children's stories with practical moral lessons. In fact, I could call out some of them today and many of us would be able to tell the lesson that the story is supposed to teach. You know the story of the tortoise and the hare, uh, whose lesson is the slow and steady wins the race. The story of the ant and the grasshopper, which teaches that it's best to prepare uh, for the days of necessity. Even the boy who cried wolf, that a liar will not be believed even in the moment when they decide to speak truth. These stories are short yet powerful and provide proverbial truths about life. In similar fashion, reading the accounts of the Gospels point to the power of narrative as Jesus uses parables to explain the principles of the kingdom of God. The New Testament is full uh, of Jesus using nature, human interactions, and everyday life as a means to communicate the truths of the kingdom of God. 
the parables of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son come to mind as prominent stories that communicate realities and requirements uh, about requirements and characteristics of God's kingdom and its citizens. Jesus introduces a new paradigm in the relationship between God and humanity by illuminating these powerful principles through poignant parables. While the stories of Aesop's fables and Christ's parables are impactful and truthful about how to live one's life, the stories that most often connect with people aren't ones that are from a created or imagined context, but those that spring from real experiences about actual lived life. There is something compelling about sharing our own stories and experiences. There is a solidarity and a connection that is created from the authenticity of telling others what we have been through. We saw this in recent years as in popular, popular culture as the hashtag Me Too became a rallying point for women who had experienced sexual harassment and assault. Women who had never had the fortitude and courage to share their own stories began to acknowledge what they experienced uh, in order to raise awareness of the prevalence of this issue and to call men to do better. Stories of the discrimination experienced by students and scholars alike while being black at prestigious institutions of higher learning have led to a ref reflection on and change in policy in the bastions of academia. And while proverbial stories teach truth, it is often personal stories that open the door for transformation. Th this is why this morning is amazing uh, that many times Christians shy away from sharing their personal stories of meeting Jesus and coming to saving faith uh, because we miss the fact that our stories are powerful. We like who we have become as the spirit of the Lord has transformed us, but we don't always like to share what we used to do or who we used to be because it isn't who we, who we are now. Uh, we can have a real uh, a consumer mindset about our own faith journey. We want people to see the final product and to buy into getting to know Jesus for themselves. But the reality is that as Christ followers, it is giving people a view into the process that will compel folks to try Jesus. When all they can see is our polished church and holier-than-thou image where everything is in its proper faith place, folks are given permission to use excuses like, I've got to get myself together before I come to Christ. And that statement is a very lie that the enemy uses to keep people from even hearing and engaging the message and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't come to Jesus as a finished project product. We have to with the will, we have to come with the willingness to engage in the process. And people need to know that you have been through a process to become who you are today. The book of Revelation teaches us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. In other words, deliverance happens at the intersection of Christ's sacrifice and our stories of the significance of that sacrifice in our lives. When folks see and hear what happened when the powerful blood of Jesus started flowing through our lives and over our lives, the seeds of transformation are planted and watered in their hearts and their minds. Because if Jesus is working in you and Jesus is working for you, and if Jesus is transforming me and changing me, then Jesus can work and transform them too. But we have to recognize, y'all, that we have a story to tell. Uh, to be clear, we are not talking about the tra trading testimonies within the confines of uh, the church experience. But when we go on to our jobs, when we go into our schools or uh, when we're on our shopping trips or when we're at, in the places where we work and play and live, our mandate as Christians is to go and tell the story of what Jesus has done for us, not just with other Christians, but with everybody. Sharing the testimonies with other believers has its place. But today we are specifically talking about taking the message of gospel transformation to the lives and of the people and the places that are not currently connected in a part of the kingdom of God. Author Chuck Swindoll says that people, quote, may deny your doctrine or attack your church, but they cannot honestly ignore the fact that your life has been changed, end quote. 
And oftentimes they can't see that our lives have been changed unless we share the story of how we have been changed. We have, a, we have a story to tell that can impact the lives of people who are looking for light in the dark world. We have a story to tell that can impact and change the lives of folks who are looking for hope in the midst of hopelessness. We have a story to tell that can provide folks with the clarity that they need in the midst of chaos. We have a story to tell, something to give them stability, to let them know that yes, they can make it. Yes, they can change. Yes, they can be different. Yes, Things can be better. We have a story to tell, and we should be ready and willing to tell it everywhere uh, that we go. And I believe this morning, this is the lesson of our text today. We find the Apostle Paul in the presence of King Agrippa. Paul has been in jail now since the rule of Felix, who was a governor of the region of Caesarea, of Caesarea. And having sought to appease the Jews who brought trumped up charges against Paul, Felix delays having Paul tried or sent to Rome to appear before Caesar as Paul has requested. Felix's apprehension about dealing with Paul's situation left Paul in limbo. And when the new governor Festus took power, he was left to deal with the unfinished business that Felix had left behind. And so Festus hears Paul's testimony and finds no real reason to keep him incarcerated or with anything to write in terms of charges to send Paul to Rome. In need of a second opinion, he decides to let King Herod Agrippa II help him to make the final call on Paul's situation. And this is where we find ourselves in chapter 26. Paul is standing before King Agrippa. Uh, of King Agrippa's wife, Bernice, and Festus telling his story. Beginning in verse 4, four Paul tells Agrippa uh, his personal testimony. Knowing that Agrippa has connection to the history and the belief of the Jews, Paul elaborates on his upbringing and commitment to the Jewish teachings and faith traditions. He was raised a Jew. He became part of the strictest Jewish sect. Uh, He passionately persecuted Christians in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then one day... Uh, He met Jesus on the Damascus road and it changed and redirected his life. Uh, He began preaching that Jesus was crucified, buried, uh, but had been raised from the dead. Um, His passion was redirected to building the kingdom of God in the world through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, y'all, was a changed man. He was no longer breathing murderous threats as he was described in Acts chapter 9 verse 1. But now he was planting churches which ended up with him being in prison on the account of the Jews who were threatened by his passionate sharing of this new message of Christ as the Messiah. Paul had quite a testimony and shared his story here, not just as a mean of de- means of defense against the charges that were being brought against him, but as a way to influence his listeners to commit to following Jesus Christ. Y'all, Paul's story is elaborate. It's filled with great drama. There is sanctioning murder. There is this pursuit to eradicate the Christ follower movement. There are flashing lights and Jesus speaking from the heavens. It is quite a testimony. In fact, we would hear something like this today and be amazed and even enamored with Paul's proclamation. We may also, as those who are believers, look at our lives and our testimony of faith and feel discouraged because our story might not be as grand as Paul's story was. Our stories might not have as much dramatic change in position and pursuit. They might not have all of the drama of Paul's account. But what we must remember is that if our lives have been touched by the transformative power of Christ, that we have a story worth telling. Yes, your story includes the revival where Jesus came into your heart on the mourner's bench years ago. Yes, Your story includes that moment when you were sitting in the house trying to decide whether you wanted to live or die and the spirit of God whispered to you and told you to put the gun or the pills or the blade down because your life was absolutely worth it. Yes, your story includes the simple moment sitting in the parking lot outside of your job when you simply decided that today was the day that you would put your trust in Jesus not because of anything bad that was 
was happening in your life, but because your spirit just felt like it was a ship without a sail. Yes, your story includes disease diagnosis. Yes, it includes abusive relationships. Yes, it includes drug use and promiscuity. Yes, it includes chasing money and material possessions. Yes, it includes whatever you want to fill in the blank with, but whatever is a part of your testimony, you ought to be thanking God and praising God for Jesus Christ because you are here today to tell about it. Whatever your struggle was, it wasn't stronger than God's love. Whatever your situation was, it wasn't greater than God's mercy. Whatever your spiritual disposition was, it wasn't too far removed for God to reach you, to pick you up, turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. And you may not be proud of what you did, but you don't have to hide from it anymore because the power that's in the name of Jesus is enough to cover any guilt and shame. You're not what you want to be, but you show sure ain't what you used to be because you met the Lord and you have a story to tell. Most of the folks that we encounter day in and day out are normal folks who are good people by the standard of the world. They look like they have it all together, but in reality, there are some cracks and some trouble spots that they do a good job of putting makeup on and masking in front of people, but that are eating away uh, at their hopefulness about life. And you may think that your ordinary story of the difference Jesus has made in your life won't have an impact. But somebody is waiting to hear that there is someone who can level with them and be an example of finding a real solution to managing the issues they face. Your story matters because it speaks to someone else's reality in a way that can open a door to them trying to trying Jesus for real and experiencing the power, the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. We we hesitate because we may not have a big Damascus Road moment in our lives, but our story is just as important as Paul's. Because the key to the influence of our story is the fact that it is our story. Authenticity, y'all, is what engages folks and pulls folks in. We, we don't have to sugarcoat it. We don't have to sanitize it. We just need to keep it real, tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth so that God can be glorified through your life. Before I was this, but then I met Jesus. I'm not perfect now, but I'm better than I was. And some of the stuff I used to do, I don't do no more. Some of the stuff I had to deal with, it's not all the way behind me, but I can deal with it better now we have to tell our story because folks will believe what we say about our experience before they will believe a scripture from the bible because we are the living epistles of God's grace God's mercy and God's favor and salvation that folks will trust and God will use to reveal God's self to people this is what Paul understood about this moment this is what Paul understood about his life as he stood before Festus and Agrippa so he stood in the midst of this, uh, of, of this courtroom scene. Agrippa asked Paul in verse 28, do you think that you can convince me to become a Christian in such a short time? And Paul's response, y'all, is brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Hopefully you think, it's, uh, think it is too. Uh, it's brilliant and it's consistent with his calling. He says, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you but all who are listening to me may become what I am except for these chains. What Paul helps us to recognize today is that our story is a part of another's process to committing to Christ. The timing of when it happens isn't on us. That's between that person and God. But what is on us is the fact that we partner with God and allow the pages of our lives to be shared with those whom, whom we come in contact with. So then what's the significance this morning of telling our stories and how God has changed us? Two points this morning and I'm out your way. I don't even got three today. Uh, first, the significance one is uh, when we tell our stories, we find ourselves in the midst of expanded opportunities. We find ourselves in the midst of expanded uh, opportunities. Check the text. Paul says to Agrippa that his prayer is that not only you, but all who will listen will be influenced and impacted by the message that he shared. Surely in a setting such as a courtroom in first century Rome, there would be many people who would be present. Governor Festus, King Agrippa and his wife, Paul's accusers were there, of course, but there were also others in the room who would hear Paul's words. Paul's goal was that his story would 
be, would be one that impacted everyone. He was testifying before Agrippa and talking to Agrippa, but his prayer was that the power of God would cause his story to compel anyone listening to follow Jesus. And y'all, this was the mission of his life since he met Christ, that he would influence anyone and everyone that heard him make Jesus to make Jesus their Lord. Y'all remember the story? He did it in the Philippian jail as the warden and his whole family ended up being converted to follow Christ. Uh, He did it in Lystra as he shared with Timothy and his family and Timothy became one of his protégés and mentees. He even did it in Athens as he spoke to philosophers about their unknown God. Paul's goal was to get to Rome to give his testimony to the emperor. Wherever Paul was, whatever Paul was doing, his goal was to tell the story of how Jesus changed his life as evidence for the need for everyone to get connected to Jesus. Y'all, there is a story about a seasoned pastor who was dealing with contention in his church meetings. Uh, There was some complaining and bickering among the congregation. Uh, And so he opened this particular church meeting with a poll question. He said, y'all, raise your hands if you have shared Christ with someone this week. No one in the congregation that was gathered in this meeting raised their hands. And the pastor proceeded to say to the people that our first and primary job as Christians is to share the good news of Christ. If you haven't done that, then you need to check your complaints and your motives at the door. We don't do this for us. We do this so that others might get to know Jesus. Y'all, the meeting was quiet, as you can imagine, and the tensions and the complaints began to subside. This pastor gets what is a major issue for us as Christians, that we get comfortable with being church folks, but that we aren't always intentionally seeking to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I dare you to imagine this morning a world where disciples of Christ are consistently using the power of their stories in spaces outside of the church. Yes, it's fine to share your testimonies to encourage another brother or sister in the faith. But we are not called to make disciples out of folks who are already disciples. We are commissioned to make disciples of all nations using our influence to expand the kingdom of God. We can't expand it if we are only talking to other Christians. Paul shows us that we should always be prepared for expanded opportunities to share the good news of Christ. Not just with the folks that we know, but anywhere that we find ourselves. Uh, Who are the people that are around us on a regular basis, but never hear us ever utter a word about Jesus? Who are the folks that are in our sphere of influence beyond our church family? This is the beauty of this season, that while pandemic has kept us from gathering in the building, it ought to be refocusing us on the real mission of the church and the disciples of Christ and that is to go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father of the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that Jesus has shown and taught and commanded and here is a word for the church today here is a word for our church and the church in America that God has little use for the church whose every Effort isn't focused in expanding the kingdom by making disciples of our communities. The greatest mission field is right here in America, and we have to tell our story everywhere we go. We gotta tell it on the family Zoom call. We've gotta tell it in the doctor's office. We gotta tell it on our social media timelines. We gotta tell it as we talk to our neighbors, socially distant, six feet apart with our mask on. God has empowered us and transformed us that we can be the city on the hill and let our light shine in the world in fact the determination of our hearts ought to be the Sunday school song that we used to sing this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine let it shine let it shine let it shine we gotta let our lights shine before men that we can bring glory to our father who is in heaven not only is there uh, from sharing our stories not only is there this these expanded opportunities but there is in fact an expected outcome listen I'm done Paul continues to say that he prays that everyone uh, under the sound of his voice would become what I am 
And that might raise a question for you. Exactly what was Paul? Uh, Paul was a passionate, devout follower of Christ who let nothing deter him from sharing the message of God's love. But he is a reformed Christ persecutor. He's one who used to do everything to stop the message from going forward. But he's transformed into one who's doing everything and giving his entire life to making sure that the message gets out. That Jesus uh, loves you and that the kingdom of God is here and that you ought to get connected. There wasn't a circumstances, circumstance rather that would stop him from sharing the message of the power and the love of Christ. Uh, he knew and he knew what he wanted to happen. Uh, he wanted everyone to have the joy that he had. Uh, he wanted everyone to experience the peace that he had. He, he wanted everyone to know the love that he had. He wanted everyone to know the contentment that he enjoyed. Uh, he knew that if they placed their trust uh, in Christ, that they could experience what he had experienced in God. And God shown had shown him grim grace for his weakness and made him new. Paul wasn't interesting in, interested rather in duplicating himself. But he wanted to replicate the impact of the power of Jesus Christ that changed his life in the lives of others. And when we are being transformed by the power of God and, the experience, and experience the freedom and the grace and the mercy that it brings into our lives, uh, we should want others to experience it as well. Uh, this is the reason that we share, y'all, uh, so that people can experience the newness of Christ. Uh, because when you have tasted it for yourself, uh, you can't help but want to share it with everyone else. Uh, that's what the psalmist wrote about in the psalm. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be uh, in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me uh, and let us exalt uh, his name together. Uh, and then he extends an invitation that says, oh, taste and see uh, that the Lord is good. Uh, blessed are those uh, that put their trust in them. Uh, and when we bless the Lord, uh, by telling how he changed us and when we bless the Lord uh, by telling how he freed us and when he blessed we bless the Lord uh, by telling uh, telling how he delivered us from our sin uh, uh, that's when folks lives begin to be changed uh, and we ought to expect uh, that every time we tell our story uh, that the spirit of the Lord would work uh, to transform the lives uh, of those that we encounter uh, check the text this morning uh, that Paul closes verse 29 he says that I desire uh, that you and all you who are listening uh, would become what I am uh, except these chains. Uh, listen, I love that part. Uh, he says except these chains. Uh, scholars suggest uh, that Paul might have been philosophically humorous in this moment. Uh, others would say uh, that he is simply pointing to his circumstances as not ideal. Uh, but perhaps this morning uh, Paul is suggesting uh, that his prayer uh, and the the expected result of following and trusting in Jesus is complete freedom that Jesus' life Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection was that we might experience a complete deliverance it was that we might experience freedom in our spiritual lives, we might experience freedom in our relationship with God, that we might experience freedom in our minds, freedom in our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ freedom that we might experience freedom like we've ever known we talk a lot about freedom in America but the freedom that Jesus offers through what he did on Calvary is a different level of freedom and when we tell our stories that is our testimony that because he died on Calvary and took on the shame and the guilt of our sin and overcome it uh, by getting up early uh, on the third day morning uh, that there is power uh, in the name of Jesus. Power to destroy yokes. Uh, power to pull down strongholds. Uh, and yes, you better believe it. There's power uh, to break every chain. Uh, and that's why we can sing today. Uh, uh, I am free. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm free. Uh, I'm no longer bound. Uh, 
no more chains holding me uh, uh, my soul is resting uh, I know it's a pandemic uh, but my soul is resting uh, I know it's political upheaval uh, but my soul is resting uh, I know it's chaos in your life uh, but my soul is resting uh, and it's just a blessing uh, praise the Lord hallelujah praise the Lord hallelujah praise the Lord If you are free today, uh, you ought to type it in the comments right now. Uh, you ought to put, I'm free. Uh, uh, hallelujah, uh, I'm free. Uh, uh, if you're free today, uh, you ought to lift your hands, uh, open up your mouth, uh, and give God your best praise. Uh, I dare you to praise him right now for being free. Uh, uh, I dare you to praise him right now uh, for the story that you have to tell. Uh, I know it's been hard. I know it took you through some ups and downs. Uh, I know you've got some scars to show. Uh, you've got some limps in your walk uh, because of what you've been through. Uh, uh, but God gave you a story to tell that lives would be changed, uh, that your life could be changed uh, so that others' lives would be changed. Uh, and you are a tell your story you ought to tell your story everywhere you go uh, that God has made you free uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, you ought to say yeah say yeah say yeah you've got a testimony You've got a story to tell. God has done amazing things in your life. You ought to share it. And even if you don't recognize that the Lord has done amazing things in your life, you ought to just take a moment to sit and reflect and think about how you've made it to where you are now. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody's life and experience is without trial and struggle. But what I do know is that even when we didn't know the Lord was keeping us, the Lord was keeping us. So that when we turn around and look back over what we've been through and how God has kept us, that we can tell our story so that somebody that's been, that is going through where we've been can know that it's not hopeless. So that they can know that God can help them just like he helped you. You ought to praise God today. Your prayer ought to be similar to what Paul's prayer is. And every time you share your thought, your prayer ought to be short time alone. My prayer is that you, all who are listening, will become what I am. Accept these chains. I, I don't want folks to necessarily have to go through the struggles I went through to get to this freedom. But I want everybody to be free. Let us bow for a word of prayer. God, we thank you today for Paul's simple yet concise response to King Agrippa, which reminds us that we have a story to tell, reminds us that when we look back on our lives and think things over, that we can truly say that we have a testimony and that, that testimony ought not stay bottled up. That testimony ought not stay in our minds and in our hearts and in our spirits, but that we ought to be willing to share. That we ought to be able to willing, really be willing to talk about how we made it through the struggle and, and, and the pain that we've endured in our lives. About how God turned us from what we used to be and is working to transform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing for everybody right now. And our prayer is today, we understand it's, as we think back over our lives that one will be, be more willing to share our story. But not only that, God, there's somebody today who is listening as they sit and they reflect right now and they think about where they've been and what they've been through, that they would make a decision right now to allow your spirit and your power to break every chain, to move them into freedom, to deliver them right now. And it's simply by saying yes to following your son, Jesus Christ. God, we're praying for some man, woman, some boy or girl right now who needs to make that decision. Some person who needs to reconnect right now with their faith. Someone who's looking to partner with a, a church family that they can grow and be authentic and share their story, recognizing that we're all sinners saved by grace. 
God, we're praying right now. We're asking God that you would move on their hearts. God, have your way in this moment. Let your spirit move. those who are watching we love you Lord and we thank you in Jesus name we pray